All right, everyone, time to put some trash in your DeLorean's Mr. Fusion and get your flux capacitors ready. Power up your TARDIS. Do some astral projection into your younger bodies like Ashton Kutcher and the Butterfly Effect or Wolverine and Days of Future Past. And jump into your hot tub time machine because we're about to do some time travel and change history. So are you guys ready for this? Yes, I, yes. I, love, the, I love the references. Don't forget, <laughs> Superman went back in time too. In his movie, he, uh, th that was a reference you know, where he flew back in time by the sheer speed of his flying ability. I, I read something one time that totally works. So oh, great yeah. reference there. Yeah. So Superman won. Yep, yep. Well, yeah. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, my name is Scott Rank. I'm a host of History Unplugged. We are joined with August Company of Parthenon Podcast Network to talk about, to go back in time, who would you kill? So let's do a rundown. First, we are joined by James Early, host of Key Battles of American History. Say hello, James. Hello, everyone. Mr. Steve Guerra, host of History of the Papacy and Beyond the Big Screen. Hello. And Richard Lim, host of This American President. How are you doing, sir? Doing very well. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, we're, uh, this is the first episode of its kind. This is a roundup where us as a collective network are going to be answering one question that I have been asked in the past by audience members, and it's something I've thought about before. So I don't know if you guys have thought about this much before, but it's uh, kind of interesting to ponder. Like, who would you kill in the past? So basically what we'll do is I'll set the stage and then we're going to go one by one and ask who would be the person that if we would eliminate from the timeline, how would that alter the flow of history and also be the most positive contribution? Now, the how isn't as important. I mean, it's kind of grisly to imagine you go back in time and strangle someone. If you want to, it can be a little bit nicer, like you go to the enchantment under the sea dance and make sure that they fade away like Marty McFly <laughs> because their parents never meet. Maybe you're like Thanos, you have an infinity gauntlet, you snap your fingers, they disappear. You're Loki, you snip their timeline out of existence. If you actually go, want to go back and kill them, doesn't matter. So it could be someone who personally did something very bad or due to unintended consequences of their movement or their philosophy could also be another person. We only have one ground rule, and that is you can't kill Hitler. Everyone always chooses Hitler. And number one, it's lazy. Number two, so many time travelers have tried to kill Hitler that he actually has a special unit within the SS to protect him from time traveler assassins. And did you guys see that special on the History Channel where they found out that Operation Valkyrie was actually time traveler assassins trying to get Hitler? Did you guys see that one? That was pretty good. I didn't know that. Interesting. I missed that one. Yeah. Well, everyone knows that he and Eva Braun made it to Argentina. So <laughs> that's a... Uh, everyone knows that. So you, you, can't, you can kill Hitler's dad, though, right? No, no you can't kill Hitler's dad. <laughs> The, the, his time travel protection squad has thought of everything. So okay. he's, still he, he's still here in our timeline. I am a little disappointed that you didn't go with my who would you violently murder <laughs> as opposed to who would you kill. <laughs> so, you know, but like, you know, the whole snapping of the I mean, it's so impersonal, you know. You know, there is something to be said for skin in the game, because if it's just done clean, if you just dispatch them cleanly, meh. Then we're just doing some armchair general work. But if you really get in there and do it, then, you know, I think that shows something that you don't have otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I thoroughly envision the scenario of... <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just, no serial killers here. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, it sounds like that we have something thought out like uh, Raskolnikov in uh, Crime and Punishment. So um, we'll see what happens. And then, and then the, you can try to kill the unkillable... Like Rasputin. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. That'll be a whole other topic right there. Who are people who have been protected by divine fate? So Saddam Hussein, Hitler, Rasputin. Mm-hmm. And Tupac. Yeah. I mean, he's he's definitely still out there. So that's what, yeah, the hip-hop community and Weekly World News have told me for the last 20 years. JFK Jr. JFK <laughs> Jr., of course. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going to be the next vice president. Watch out. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So uh, let's cue it up. Who is our... First, oh, so James is our first contender. I thought as an entry, he would be appropriate because, James, you've done a lot of hypotheticals on your Facebook page. You're actually the progenitor of the uh, presidential fight club idea that you and I did together. You ran that whole survey on American History Fanatics. You've done the presidential beauty contest. It's sort of like the Zoolander walk-off, but for presidents. <laughs> so I really think this is in your wheelhouse. So take us away, James. Who will you 
assassinate, snap away from existence, whatever your purview is and why. All right. Well, I'm going to preface this by saying that mine is going to take out Hitler too as a byproduct. So it will be not necessary. There will be no Hitler. Yes. My choice, really? who I would kill, I'm going to save about roughly 100 million lives by my calculation. And it's going to be, it's going, hang on a second. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm, like, is I'm, he I'm murdering them right now? Conjuring <laughs> them up and I'm, I'm blasting them out of in my mind. This is like, uh, what's that movie, Scanners, no, just... where you, <laughs> yeah. it's like Scanners, you focus hard enough and their head explodes. My, my history <laughs> book is changing oh. right now. <laughs> the power of mental energy. energy. Okay. Like back to the Seriously, future. There, I'm going to take out Gavrilo Princip, <laughs> yeah. the assassin of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of the Austro Austro-Hungarian Empire. And here's... Oh, I don't. Why do you well, hate actually, Serbians? I lived among them. I'm, for, I'm just kidding. I'm I lived just kidding. Among, and not just Serbians, Serbs, but Bosnian Serbs. But here's my reasoning. Okay, so, and and Dan Carlin agrees with me, by the way. So I automatically win because I've got Carlin on my side. You know, it might be nice uh, again. That's again right. Again and again uh, and again. So, but I thought of it before I heard him say it. So he he agrees with me. Not I agree with him. But anyway, so here's the deal. If you if if and I, I would have to take him out right before he shoots the Archduke, okay? So if you know the story of the assassination, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys do, and I'm, probably a lot of our listeners do, but there, he was part of a conspiracy of seven assassins, one of whom actually didn't was kind of the leader and didn't try to actually uh, do anything. But out of the six guys that had weapons, four of them just didn't do anything. They just completely failed. One of them threw a bomb, which bounced off of the Archduke's car and instead wounded about, 20 other people in a, in a car behind them. And to make a long story short, I'm going to leave out some details, but the Archduke decided to go to the hospital to visit some of the people who had been injured. And so it was going to be a different route. By this point, Princip had already given up and he had just gone off to drown his sorrows with a sandwich and a beer or something like that. So he was sitting in a cafe and to his utter amazement, here comes the car with the Archduke. The Archduke's driver didn't find out about the route change, and so he made a wrong turn, and it just happened to be right in front of where Princip was standing. So it's at that point that I take him out. I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, use my martial arts skills to wrestle his gun away and shoot him or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But I'm, if, if you get rid of Princip, then the Archduke does not die. And therefore, you do not have an international incident. There is no casus belli between Austria and Serbia. And so there is no World War I, probably. I mean, you know, there were, as you all know, there was a lot of tension and, and something else could have happened, but we can't say for sure that it would have. So no principe means no World War I. No World War I means probably no Russian Revolution and no communist Russia, no Soviet Union. It also means no World War II. It probably means no carving up of the Middle East by European bureaucrats like in France and Britain, creating all these unstable countries. And it also means no Cold War. So if you figure 20 million dead in World War I, I think it's about 50 or 60 in World War II million. Who knows how many people that were killed by Stalin and Lenin and the, and the other Soviet leaders outside of the wars, plus Cold War, there were deaths. Obviously, you might not even have 9-11. You might not have had some of the wars we had in the Middle East. So I think it comes out to about 100 million lives. So that's why I get rid of Princip. Uh, and, and also, as I kind of implied earlier, there would be no Hitler. I mean, there would have been, I mean, Hitler would have probably still been born, but he wouldn't have risen to power, probably. So yeah, maybe he'd be this world famous artist. With you, you'd have his painting on your wall or something, but he wouldn't be this horrible dictator that killed millions of people. So that's my that's my thought. What do you guys think? Prove me wrong. Go ahead, make my day. Hmm. <laughs> Hitler's artwork really isn't that good. <laughs> well, okay, I I could see that point. Yes, Richard, where do you think? Well, you could play this terrible game where you show people. The, one of his you know pieces of art and they're like that's really good and then oh hey sorry that that's hitler's art <laughs> you know and then they, they feel terrible about it yeah well actually so what you said i i distinctly remember my history professor in college pointing at world war one and showing all the after effects and just saying that this was the pivot point of humanity in the 20th century was 
World War One, and it le- led to all of that, which which is very true. And I think at the same time, I mean, just kind of throwing this out there, I don't what I you know this isn't particularly profound on my part, but at the same time, all those problems may have not happened, or they may have just they may have been different problems that happened instead, or maybe communism rises in another country somewhere at another time. So, it, you know, it's always hard to know exactly right. whether or not all of like, like horrible things wouldn't have happened had he not done that. But nonetheless, I, I mean, yes, it is very, it's a very compelling argument to say that this moment did definitely contribute to those horrible things that did happen afterwards, whether they would have happened anyways, in some other way, who knows, you know, but you know, when you mentioned the Cold War, that already got me thinking because the Cold War was such a global event. You know, the the Cold War is what spurred America to go to the moon. It's what led to a lot of computer technology. Because when you have a competitor, you have incentive to try to be better than the other side. So then that brings up the question of, would we have so many of these advances that we have today without it, you know, with GPS or you know, going to the moon, you know, meant that computers had to be smaller. So do, do we get the PC revolution without the Cold War? So all of mm. these things, it's, it, it kind of blows your mind, the after effects of it. And it's amazing to think that this crazy, unlikely event, you know, Princip killing the Archduke had such an impact on that. So you're saying I just ruined the moon landing, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, right. <laughs> Thanks, James. The Soviets or the Russians or whoever it is, the Second Reich, since it still exists, just won the space race. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I pleasure. And I, I'm, a, I'm a big NASA geek, so yeah. so a, par- a little part of me died, but that's okay. <laughs> I guess we're saving we're saving a hundred million people. So, yeah. what do you think, though, James? That they it seems like all of those countries were really spoiling for a fight, though. Do you think something else could have kicked it all off? Well, I, yeah, I think there's a decent chance that something else might have happened, but. But we can't necessarily assume that whatever that something is would have led to this huge continent-wide conflagration. Can, did I say that right? Conflagration? Big fire. Yeah. Con- <laughs> con- conflagration. 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 Thank yeah. you. I'm, yeah. I'm tired. Sorry. But, um, you know, it could have been, let's say something happened in, I don't know, Bulgaria. I mean, it could have ended up just being a local fight between Bulgaria and Austria or something like that. You might not have had this huge thing where, you know, everybody jumps in. It, it is obvious. It's very hard to say. I was talking with my wife about this earlier. And I don't know if you guys read the novel Eleven Twenty Two Sixty Three by Stephen King, but it's a good. You should you should read it if you get a chance or listen to the audio book. But I'll just say that the whole point of it was a guy goes back in time to save John F. Kennedy, assuming that everything would be better because of that, but what ends up happening is not better. So it's just kind of the law of unintended consequences. Anyway. I'd love for them to do that, but do it for like somebody desperately trying to stop John Travolta from doing Battlefield Earth. (laughs) And That's a great, horrible movie. It's the Citizen Kane of terrible movies. It really is. (laughs) Yeah, it's unwatchable. Um, (laughs) But imagine like if you tried to do it, but but you just learn that no, this has to happen. Like John Travolta's <laughs> career has to end this way, you know. <laughs> so, sorry. What's I the just, line here? What does he call people? Puny rat brains? Or um, <laughs> man, now I'm thinking of lines from Battlefield. I, I tried to block off the movie itself, <laughs> but you know, mm. yeah. Well, so I mean, James. I mean, it's a really interesting question because at first, as you were saying that, I thought. You know, as an Ottomanist, Europe was looking at the Ottoman Empire for decades, imagining how they could break it apart and add it to their colonial realm. So it sort of seemed like there are social forces that were put into motion that had the Ottoman Empire not fallen apart in World War One, something else would have happened. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Yeah. Right. So the, the social historian part of my brain is thinking, oh, well, there are forces in gear. The German high command is imagining that they need to have resource extraction and go attack Russia before it's too industrialized so that they can win this colonial game that all the European powers are going after. But on the other hand, I think that like a lot of history, it's swung too far in the social history direction and has sort of neglected biographies that... Mm-hmm. Yes, societies move a lot of things. Societies are like battleships that have incredible inertia and you can't really dislodge them. But there are exceptional people that come along and really do stir the pot. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It, uh, yeah, there, there's someone commanding the ship, right? And, you know, that matters. Yeah, the, the, the leadership in so many countries at that time in Europe was just so awful, you know? I mean, yeah, amen to that. Wilhelm and Tsar Nicholas and even King George, I, I don't think he was that great. So who knows? Maybe they, st- they still would have managed to screw it up. <laughs> who knows? I mean, perhaps one of the most inbred points in European political yeah. history, which for Europe says a whole yeah. lot. Yeah. Uh, since it's yeah. basically thousands of years of inbred leadership Ugh. and and uh hemophilia stalking every generation which, right. which was awful i mean it was just horrible oh yeah so which that could very well be a good seg to another leader who uh richard you mentioned speaking of uh underqualified leadership in slight inbreeding maybe a little bit of that habsburg jaw do you have a candidate who perhaps fits some of that criteria well, actually, James already mentioned him, uh, just mentioning terrible leaders during World War I. So this is a great segue, actually, because James went with Gavrilo Princip, which was, you know, a, a specific person at the specific moment. And so it, which history gave him the opportunity to make an impact. And I guess my argument would be, OK, you know, going back to kind of the broader things that were going on at the time. The biggest one of the biggest issues was just Germany's choice to pursue a militaristic path Mm -hmm. to alienate their neighbors, Mm -hmm. departing from what Bismarck had tried to do. And so all of that goes back to Kaiser Wilhelm, who was very clearly a, you know, an alter. He altered German policy very clearly away from the, the course that had been going by firing Bismarck and basically saying, okay, you know, Germany should rise. I don't give a crap about what anyone says around me. If that starts arms races, so be it. Forget you all. So my choice is Kaiser Wilhelm II. And for a few reasons that, you know, a few that I just mentioned. Also, I just want to say that Hitler was a net loss for humanity. However, if there's one person he benefited that that he served as, as a positive force for, it was Kaiser Wilhelm II. Because People forget how horrible he was. Like Kaiser Wilhelm II was, you know, he was an autocrat. He was a tyrant. He was virulently anti-Semitic. But of course, no one remembers that because Hitler was that times, you know, even more efficiently, right? And, mm-hmm. and more, even more ruthlessly. But if there's anyone that Hitler did a favor for, it was the fact that he was so bad that he made people forget how bad Kaiser Wilhelm was. And so I chose him because, you know, perhaps... That would forestall. That would prevent all the things that James just mentioned, as far as if Princip hadn't killed the Archduke. You know, perhaps Wilhelm could have turned Germany in the direction of perhaps um, had he continued what Bismarck did, he could have turned Germany in the direction of more constructive rise, where he was working in coordination with the European powers and not threatening them. He had an opportunity to do so because he was descended from Queen Victoria. He had the possibility of having good relations with the the British royal family, but he threw it all away. And not only that, but if you get to know him, the person, he really was just terrible. I mean, this is a guy who openly rooted for his father to die, his father, Frederick, who unfortunately got to reign for a very short period of time. And he was more of a liberal and he basically was in poor health. And Before his grandfather died, before Wilhelm I died, Wilhelm II was basically like measuring the drapes, uh, you know, in his throne room and getting ready. So he was basically like celebrating the fact that his father was dying. He hated his mom. And part of this had to do with the fact that his mom, when he was born, it was a very difficult pregnancy. And then it caused his arm to be disabled, which was like, you know, back then a sign of... I guess like he was some sort of, I don't know what the word is, but he, he was like just some sort of inferior human being. But he had, a, he had a complex about that, but he took it out on his mother. He blamed her. He made her life miserable. And, you know, the other thing too is that he was just a, a really creepy guy. There are actually letters that they found recently where he wrote letters to his own mom where he started basically hitting on her and just, you know, saying, oh, like if I was with you, I would do this and that and that. And so he, he was just a creepy guy, somebody that just the world would be a lot better without. And he lived up until 1940. So he lived a long life after abdicating and, and all that stuff. But yeah, just the more I learn about this guy, the more I'm just kind of like, you know, 
gross. You know, I just, I just don't want to be around this guy. And, you know, it's, it's really tragic. He actually was there when his grandmother died, Queen Victoria, and he was holding her up. And I think his cousin was there too. I think actually, no, his, yeah, his uh, uncle, George Edward VII, who, who became, who succeeded Victoria as the monarch. And so they were right there. And within a dozen years, his country was at war with England. And so, yeah, just everything I learned about this guy is just uniformly negative. He's just horrible. And now a word from our sponsors. Yeah, you know, I think you raise a good point because I was just refreshing my memory. I was reading up on this, the prelude to World War One a little bit and earlier today and yesterday. And, you know, let's say, okay, Prince doesn't die and you get your wish, but but let's say that, well, let's look at the real timeline. So Princip kills the Archduke and then Austria decides to go to war with Serbia. But what Austria did was they basically checked with Wilhelm and the German government and said, do you have my back? And they said, yes, we do. Germany said very specifically, we will support you, whatever you do, which as you guys know, and our, probably our listeners do, has it's been, it's come to be known as the blank check. And maybe if you had had somebody who was a better leader, more of a Bismarckian kind of leader, I mean, I, Bismarck, I think he was dead by then anyway, right? But maybe if you had somebody who ruled in the spirit of Bismarck, they would not have given Austria that blank check. You know, they would have said, whoa, whoa hold on there, babe, hold on. This could get out of hand really fast. And no blank check, I'm convinced if Austria didn't have Germany's backing, they would not have done this whole like, full-blown war against Serbia. I don't know, they might have sent in a punitive expedition or something, but it wouldn't have been, I think it was like 20 divisions that they're going to send into Serbia and they're going to bomb Belgrade and things like that. So I think you're raising a pretty mm -hmm. good point. But my question for you is who would have been the the Kaiser? You know, after Frederick died, who would have, who would the throne have gone to? Had Let's say Wilhelm had died as a child or something. Oh, Wilhelm II? Who, who yeah, would have if, he had, if he had died, well, at what point are you going to kill him, I guess? <laughs> Like, you're going to make sure he's never born or? Yeah, well, uh, so by then, Wilhelm II already had a son. That, so that, that's actually a good question. Um, I, I didn't think about that. But his son, Wil, also Wilhelm, mm -hmm. the German crown prince, he was the son of Wilhelm II. And he, yeah, I guess he, yeah, he was he a was pretty reasonable in, guy, if I remember correctly. He goes on to command. Yeah, just give him a regency for a decade or two. He commanded, yeah, the, he, com he commanded a division on the Western Front and did really well. You remember that, Scott? And, uh, that was something that we talked about a long time ago. Yeah, but. give, give uh, Bismarck, you know, a, a little while longer while Wilhelm III does his regency. And that sounds a lot better than the alternative. My point is that if you're going to kill off Wilhelm, you got to have somebody better to replace him. <laughs> that's a good point. Yes, that's a good point. I just, I just you know... He, he couldn't have been as creepy as his dad. That's all I'm going to say. Like, just yeah. Wilhelm II was such, a, you know, anyways. Even if you had somebody just slightly more liberal, maybe they still slice up Poland and, you know, do a little bit. But then they don't massively attack France and get like 100 million people killed along the way. Like, maybe there's a little less fallout from that. And 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 if he's not good then the bullet I used to kill Wilhelm II will also kill his son, Wilhelm, and put their <laughs> second son, Prince I, I tell Frederick of Prussia. You're cheating. <laughs> you can't did I build the rules? <laughs> this I, is an M50 right here. Yeah. <laughs> just hey, armor-piercing hey, rounds. Hey, I, can't, I can't stop the bullet. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. It's just, it's just it? still going, you know? <laughs> That's funny. But no, that is a good question. I, I, uh, yeah. I, my hope is that Wilhelm II would be better. Or uh, the, his son, I mean. The third, wouldn't it be? Yeah. Yeah, Wilhelm the third. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. Well, I, uh, Otto von Bismarck, I mean, I have a lot of respect for him as a statesman. And I found out talking to a guest that Henry Kissinger, the person that he looked up to the most as a statesman was Otto von Bismarck. So oh, how yeah. do you keep a messy web of alliances together, use power politics when necessary, uphold people who establish order, even if they do it by any means necessary, whatever it is that you have to do. So hard act to follow, especially when you're an imbecile. Uh, I yeah. agree there. <laughs> All right. Shall I? Uh, well, an imbecile my... with a lot, a lot of confidence. Like he he had the gall to to 
fire Bismarck uh-huh. and and then say, you know, he was wrong. I'm right. And the guy was like 20 something at that time. But anyways. Yeah, let's just fire like a lot of confidence goes a long way in life. <laughs> well, it's it's yeah. like my uh, one of my friends used to say about uh, well, he, he used to say this about college students. I'm not affirming or disaffirming, but he says, you know, they're, they're never in doubt and yet always wrong. <laughs> It really, it's something special to live at the top of the slope of the Dunning-Kruger effect, where when you're first learning something, you have massive confidence before you, Mm -hmm. you know, enter the valley of ignorance, whatever they call it, when you learn a little more and you know how much you don't know. Some Mm -hmm. people can live their entire lives on the summit of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I would like to think that Wilhelm is one of those people. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we've all been at that point. (laughs) I I remember first learning about presidents and thinking, what a terrible president. And I I just look back, I'm like, what did I, what did I know? You know, yeah. but anyways. Yeah. I'm uh, digging into the life of Warren Hardy, G Hardy, and I'm actually getting new respect for him. So it's yeah, amazing what you can yeah. uncover when you're open-minded. Great poet, nothing else. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so some of the more uh, eagle-eyed or eager listeners will know what that reference is to. All right. So I think uh, I'll um, pull out my person. So I, I really thought about this a lot. And I mean, when you think about alternate timelines and time travel, you think of butterfly effects and, I first thought of who's someone that if I would kill, even though he wasn't necessarily bad, his movement was terrible. One was a governor of Virginia, William Berkeley in the 1670s, who put down Bacon's Rebellion. And long story short, his uh, hardening of class and racial divisions in Virginia arguably led to the passage of the Virginia Slave Codes in 1705 and basically slavery in America. So what if slavery had been avoided? That'd be great. Then I thought, well, what about Thomas Malthus? He had the idea of Malthusianism and population control in the 1700s, which led to all sorts of bad ideas like eugenics and Nazism and forced sterilization and all that. But then I thought, you know, I want someone who directly has blood on his hands. So who can I choose? And my answer was Genghis Khan. So the reason I went with Genghis Khan is for a couple of reasons. Number one, he and his descendants killed a lot of people. Upwards of about 60 million or so, about 10% of Earth's population, which today would be 800 million people. That's World War I and II, Spanish influenza, bubonic plague, and a bunch of other things all tied into one. And I mean, it wasn't just he killed a lot of people. He wiped out ancient cities like Merv, which was on the Silk Road, one of the biggest cities in the medieval world. The population of Iran was something like 10% of its total population once he and his armies were done. It didn't recover till the 20th century. Kiev and Rus's population was cut in half. So was medieval Hungary. And then they destroyed not just humans, but infrastructure too. So canals in Iran and Iraq were destroyed. It led to crop failure, mass starvation, and all that. So, and you know, some people might say that there's a lot of Mongol fanboys out there because they think, oh man, Genghis was an awesome conqueror. And he was. He was a brilliant tactician, and so were his descendants. And they might just say, well, you know, I mean, that was the medieval world. Everyone was brutal. He just happened to be more successful. So I pick on him. Well, I mean, the Mongols had a specific policy of violence and extermination as sort of psychological warfare because they always had limited numbers. And when you're controlling Eurasia, you have to use a little bit of psychological warfare. So typically they would use extermination as a way to control populations. So when they would conquer a city and then just the army would move on and there'd be a small garrison left behind, people wouldn't rebel because they thought, well, even if we do, and there's only a few soldiers here, the army will return and we'll be exterminated. Then people might say to me, well, Scott, you're just relying on Orientalist Western sources that want to make the Mongols as bloodthirsty savages. So what are you talking about? Well, I don't just have to rely on historical documents. I can also rely on ecology to prove how bad Genghis and his descendants were. So one of my favorite little historical facts is that There was a team from uh, the Carnegie Institute in 2011 that determined between the 13th and 14th centuries, something like 700 million tons of atmospheric carbon was scrubbed from the atmosphere because millions of acres of farmland was returned to forests because farmers were killed, the land was depopulated, it became forest again, and it scrubbed the atmosphere from carbon. So anyone want to guess who killed all those farmers and returned all that farmland to forests? Kaiser Wilhelm. No, uh, Genghis Khan. <laughs> <Governor> <laughs> Prince. Kaiser Wilhelm. Someone commandeered our time machine and went back there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Genghis Khan caused the only known case of man-made trigger global cooling. So environmental science itself confirms it. 
And it wasn't just the total human death toll, although I think that alone would be enough to make a case. But when we talk about kind of destructions of the past, like the barbarians or the vandal invasion of Rome, or Steve and I talked about the movie Agora of Christians being charged with destroying the Library of Alexandria in the 600s, the destruction of ancient civilization. I mean, that's an exaggeration with Alexandria, but I think there's a great case to be made that if there's sort of like the great historical destructor of civilizations, that would be Genghis and his descendants. So like when they destroyed the Khwarizmian Empire in Iran, they take out Bukhara, where Avicenna is a scholar. And I mean, how many of his treatises were just completely burned and destroyed? Or with the siege of Baghdad, there were all these stories that the Tigris River was black with the ink of books that were thrown in there and someone could ride back and forth on horseback for days. So, I mean, all of the works that we have from the ancient world aren't original. They're copies made in the Middle Ages. So there's just tons and tons and stuff that was lost. And so again, there's a lot of Mongolian fanboys out there. It might say, okay, Scott, yeah, he killed people, but Genghis Khan created the modern world. Yeah, like that Um, book that that you, you and I talked about that book one time. I read it. What's it called? Genghis Khan and the Creation of the Modern World or something like that. Genghis Khan and the making of the modern yeah, world. Yeah, that guy thinks that he everything good that we have now <laughs> is a result of Genghis Khan. It's like it's really well written. So mm-hmm. I, I hats off to Jack Weatherford. He's a really good writer. Yeah. But like anything that you can think of that you have from I don't know, the Electoral College up to iPads was basically created by <laughs> Genghis Khan, according to him. So I, I, I also um, okay, not I always suspected. Yeah, I knew it. Hey, I knew you it. want to kill this guy? <laughs> I know. I mean, we're going to go back to the dark ages. Well, so, I mean, I just like looked at the the list of things that Jack Weatherford credits him with. So religious tolerance, um, meritocracy, rule of law, roads for intercontinental trade, postal systems, diplomatic immunity. So there's no Lethal Weapon 2 movie if we don't have Genghis Khan and he even says oh, that Thomas okay. Jefferson that's got the me. idea. That's it for me. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. We all have our I lines. like that one in the series. <laughs> you cannot kill this man. It's a great series. Diplomatic community has just been revoked. Do you kill all of his descendants too? Because I that might mean me. <laughs> that's a very good point. Because about many tens, if not hundreds of millions of people are descendants of Genghis. Genghis got around. Um, and his descendants got around too. So... Mm. That's something to think about. I mean, there's going to be a pretty big butterfly effect by taking out Genghis for sure. Richard, you're starting to fade. Can you? (laughs) Richard, Richard, he's gone. Well, I mean, probably two or three of us would. I mean, there's a little bit of Genghis in all of us. It's um, I think it's like one out of eight. It's like one out of eight people on Earth are somehow descendants of Genghis. It's like Charlemagne. It's it's crazy. I know. It's yeah, he yeah, he was uh, popular. Well, consensually and non-consensually. Let's not go into that direction. But so anyway, with Jack Weatherford, he basically says that Thomas Jefferson got the idea for the Declaration of Independence. And without like doing a review of that book, other historians have said any good thing that the Mongols came up with was purely pragmatic. So they didn't embrace other religions with open arms. They thought, okay, we just conquered Eurasia and we have two dozen religions. So, okay, practice your religion. I don't care. Pay me taxes or I'll kill you. A lot of their positive effects were purely incidental. And Dan Carlin makes this point in his series about the Mongols that people credit them with good things, but a thousand years from now, we're going to talk about how great Hitler was because he gave us Volkswagen. Yeah, Volkswagens are great, but let's weigh the scales here. Uh, It doesn't really make up for all the other things he did. And then one last thing, too, is like there was like the age of discovery. They'll say, oh, the Mongols connected east and west. And yes, that is true. Marco Polo couldn't have gone to China without the protection of the Mongols. But I don't know. I think the age of discovery would have happened because the Portuguese were going down the coast of Africa anyway for the gold trade and trade winds between North America and Europe sort of made it inevitable that mm-hmm. the age of discovery would happen. Maybe it would have been a couple decades later, but I think the negative outweighs the positive. So I'm killing Genghis. What do you guys think? Oh, I mean, first off, what happens to the movie The Conqueror with John Wayne? Does John <laughs> Wayne <laughs> die and he's still alive today because he doesn't get irradiated on the set well, of you, The you, Conqueror? You, well, you hmm. you should have you should choose John Wayne as your person to kill, but just right before that movie. <laughs> oh. Now, the problem is whenever I am reading about Genghis Khan, it's hard not to think of John Wayne in that role and him in his yellow face makeup talking exactly like John Wayne, but saying, I do not trust a Tatar woman, pilgrim. Uh, (laughs) 
So we would have been lost uh, the Conqueror, which is something to think about. But I would like to think in this alternate timeline that John Wayne would have chosen equally and ins- culturally and racially insensitive role to play. So I don't know what that could have been, but it could have been worth it. That's fair. I mean, you think though with Genghis Khan and the Mongols, it would have changed everybody's history. Vietnam, China, Korea, Japan, Russia, mm-hmm. Iran, uh, Iraq, like just about it. Didn't the Mongols go as far as Hungary or something or Romania? Like that's yeah, they did. basically yeah. everything. Yeah, they are. Islamic civilization was permanently altered by them. They destroyed the main centers of learning. They also converted Islam. So they destroyed it before they spread it out further. Trade networks were completely altered. Population concentrations were completely changed. So it's um, a radically, radically different change. And that's where the butterfly effect really goes crazy. So there's almost nothing that wouldn't be... You would have to get down to basically sub-Saharan Africa to not have civilization that wouldn't be affected by it. That's insane. Yeah. He's a big, he's a big deal. Yeah. I, I didn't know that thing about the global cooling. That, that is wild. And I mean, so that really would have affected everyone. Like if you lived in a uh, village in Southern Chile, you'd be affected by the global cooling. Yeah. So even if you're in the new world, you would be changed by it. I did think when you guys were talking about how to take somebody out, whether personally, Genghis, I think I would have to come with heavy ammunition or uh, Thanos snap him away because he could probably pick me off from at least 200 yards away with his archery skills. Hand to hand, I wouldn't stand a chance. Um, I've seen Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure to know enough times that he's a very (laughs) fierce warrior. So I'm going to need some modern tech to take him down because... He would be very, very hard otherwise, I think. You're going to need SEAL Team 6 with your... <laughs> and, and you've seen The Conqueror, too. Yeah. 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 I don't know if any of you guys have seen uh, Mongol. It was a movie produced by the government mm-hmm. of Kazakhstan. Mm-hmm. When Borat came out, they wanted to improve their international image. So the way they thought they would do it is create an international hit about Genghis Khan. And it's an awesome movie. Wait, um, I, I can't, the, are, are, we, are you being serious about the? it's a response to Borat? No, I'm serious. Like the <laughs> government of Kazakhstan spent $30 million on a movie about It is Genghis a good Khan. movie. I enjoyed it yeah. a lot. Production's good. Yeah, because it was, it was supposed, wasn't it supposed to be a trilogy? Yeah, it's too bad they didn't pick because it ends right when he becomes the great Khan. It's all about his rise. Yeah, I would. I guess they figured John Wayne had already done it. So. <laughs> I know. You really can't top it. I mean, it's been it's been done. Everyone right. will just talk about that movie. So there's no point in going back. It's like redoing Spartacus. I mean, yeah, what are you true, do? true. I, I t- when I want a good laugh or share a good laugh, I, I tell people about the like John Wayne is good because everyone has that same reaction. Like <laughs> he did what? <laughs> you know, you can see it in your mind and the result is 10 times worse than whatever you can imagine oh, yeah. before you see yeah. it. It works yeah. on so many levels. <laughs> well, um, with, so yeah. with a very Asian Rita Hayworth. <laughs> Like they didn't even try or they didn't even try with her, at least with the, John Wayne. You can say that they at, at least leaned in with racial stereotypes with everybody else. It's like, you know, everybody's just Asian. Go with it. <laughs> yeah, it's an alternate reality where it's filmed in Southern California and everyone is white. But Which I think speak. makes it worse in a way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think about it, at least if you're going to go and uh, just do this attack on a whole culture and people, at least do it. Not like the, you're not even giving it the, the these people enough respect to completely denigrate their culture. That's the that's the worst part of it. It's lazy. So, so then here's the question. Which was a bigger disaster for the world? Uh, the global <laughs> cooling that he did that Genghis Khan did or the movie starring John Wayne about <laughs> the guy who did the glow, you know? I mean, we're still feeling the ripple effects. The the toxic radiation is still there where all those people died on the filming set of the Conqueror. That's true. Um yes. the jury's still out, I'd say, <laughs> one way or another. And now a word from our sponsors. Well, uh, Steve, you have Dio or sorry, that first syllable I said could be any number of people. I don't want to steal your thunder. So who do you erase from the timeline? So I'm going to erase Diocletian, who is the emperor of Rome in the late third century. He wasn't the one the Roman Empire had really been on the rocks for about 7,500 years or so 
from the late 100s into the 200s, where there was just constant war, the empire broke up into several pieces, a couple emperors put it together, it broke up into pieces again. And it was just a, it was just a mess. The economy was in the dumps. The, there was constant warfare. This is really when the barbarians start crashing through the gates. And this general Diocletian, he comes along and he institutes a system, a new system of government, which you think, well, yeah, he's a reformer. So, and maybe his reforms are going to do a good thing. And on paper, his reforms really were exactly what the Roman Empire needed. It it was going to break the empire into halves and then those halves into halves. So four different parts of the empire where these each quarter of the empire would have a semi-independent leader who could take care of more local issues. The big thing, though, is that with Diocletian's reforms, it completely bloated the bureaucracy of the Roman Empire. The taxes went up. They had to make more money, so they debased the coinage, and by debasing the coinage, it caused massive inflation, but the government wouldn't take that inflated coin and taxes. They wanted good coins and in-kind payments. So that even wrecked the economy more because people wouldn't grow more chickens or whatever farmers do, and they hoarded all their gold. So it took more of the good stuff out of the economy. Then on top of that, Diocletian put in a religious reforms where it basically made him the god and his second in command like the second god. And in order to put these religious reforms into effect, they heavily persecuted all the different religions, particularly Christianity, which was had really taken off during the third century. So he caused all sorts of social social problems by instituting this religious persecution. So I would have killed him basically any time before he became emperor. And I mean, in those days, he could have just stubbed his toe and died of massive infection. So I'll go with that one. What I think the fallout would have been is, first off, the Roman Empire would have just naturally broken up into probably three or four different parts that would have been a more bottom-up approach that each one of them could have gone off in their own directions after that. And it wouldn't have been this just massive bureaucracy, which really caused, if you look at what the Dark Ages were, the Dark Ages were more or less a Great Depression caused by Diocletian's terrible economic reforms. Constantine takes over by, from Diocletian and basically does everything that Diocletian does, except that he makes Christianity the not quite the f- official religion, but you get the where now it's not Diocletian's weird paganism is going to be the official religion. It's Christianity. That, and there's the, just this idea set up that you can only have one religion. So religious pluralism, which r- had been pretty much a going thing in Europe at that time and in the Roman Empire, that gets killed off that idea. So I think what would have happened is really the economy of Europe would have slowly readjusted more like creative destruction and come out just much better. And we wouldn't be saddled with all these ideas that just kept coming along that you have to have one religion, that all this top-down taxation and clipping coins to inflate the currency, all of this just would have gone away and we'd live in paradise right now. (laughs) <laughs> without Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> <laughs> well, too, you got to yeah. take into effect all the Christians that were persecuted and put to death. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands you would have saved lives. Well, yeah, that too, for sure. Yeah, that, that whole idea that let's just kill everybody who doesn't agree with us, that really sticks around in Europe. Yeah, he tried price fixing and price controls for a while, didn't he, as part of his economic package? Yeah, and if your father was a certain trade, all the children thereafter had to stick to the trade. So we start with medieval serfdom right there. And I was thinking about Diocletian and you listed that. My mind went to, this is very random, but a cable debate between Paul Krugman, the New York Times economics columnist, and Ron Paul, the hardcore libertarian senator. Mm, Oh, that's a good one. 
And they were arguing. So Paul Krugman was saying to Ron Paul that your ideas were from the 1920s of returning to the gold standard. And Ron Paul shot back, well, your ideas are from 2000 years ago. And Paul Krugman said, well, I don't know if we're going to talk about Diocletian here. And so I don't know (laughs) if Ron Paul was making a reference to price fixing or whatnot, but there you go. So people are also dogging on him there, too. So I guess you're in good company, Steve. I think especially Diocletian's one that a lot of people, I mean, you know, any, almost any scholarly book you read says that he's the one who saved the Roman Empire and his stock is incredibly high amongst most historians. But you look at what he did and it was a complete disaster. Yeah, it's too easy to pick on people like Nero or Caligula. They're a little bit more colorful in their awfulness, I suppose. Yeah, I had to look it up. It says here. Sorry, are, are you saying that you feel like he would have maybe the, the Dark Ages would have been shortened without his influence? Is that, that's essentially what you're saying, right? Yeah, I think I, I would say that that the Dark Ages would have been shorter, that Europe would have it would have settled out into probably three, four different different kingdoms, probably or something of that sort that would have been a lot more defensible. They would have been able to. Uh, integrate probably with the with the Germanic tribes that were coming in. It wouldn't have had to have been that they had to keep bringing in these mercenaries and they just would have generally not had this whole influx of bureaucracy and, you know, what you might call big government that just completely weighed down the whole system. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like he was somebody who he he pursued reforms, but it's kind of the unintended consequences like he did it in a very unwise way. As opposed to, you know, I mean, well, I, I guess he definitely had intentions as far as persecuting Christians and whatnot. But in terms of administration over the regime or the, the empire. Yeah, he was basic. His reforms created all the bad things that we have today. Like economics, let's inflate the currency. That'll help us. So he's a reverse Genghis Khan. Yeah, basically. Yeah, if you think of it that way. And there's not even a John Wayne movie about him. That's, Ooh. I mean, maybe the, if the Conqueror hadn't been made, he would have made the Diocletian movie. <laughs> and I think we just keep going back to that. I'm looking on IMDb to see if it was there. <laughs> there, there was, an, there was a, an opera written in 1690 about his life. So there's something out there. It's called Diocletian. Who's, the, who's today's John Wayne to tackle that kind of project? Ooh, ooh that's tough. Well, it's less about John Wayne. It's more about... Get someone who's the complete opposite of who you're trying to cast him as, you know? Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say Danny Glover. I don't, I don't know why. I'm just, you know? Yeah. Why okay. the heck not? We have Lethal Weapon. We've mentioned that in this uh, episode. So that is their diplomatic immunity. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we have, I think, uh, does it sound like, guys, we've cleaned the timeline? We've, we stopped World War I. We stopped inflation and religious persecution. We've saved somewhere between 500 million and a billion lives. And hey. I think we did it. I think we're in the, in the, in the best timeline right now, if we've uh, done all of our work correctly. Not bad for a day's work. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there couldn't yeah, we, be any unintended consequences that could come out of <laughs> oh, this. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Everything will be course. perfect. Not a single thing. No. Peace in the world, all that. There's a book by Stephen Fry, and I forget the name of it, but the whole conceit is that someone finds out time travel. So he causes Hitler's father to not be able to reproduce, but then he returns to his time and everything is much worse as a result of it. So I think like what you were saying, James, with uh, 11, 22, 63, the Stephen King book. Wait, who did this? What, what is this work? What is it called? Uh, it's a book by Stephen Fry. It was written in the 90s, and I forget the name of it, but oh, it has it's okay. this uh, alternate history or a uh, time travel book like that. So he's a so he's a he's a Nazi, clearly. Yeah. So he's saying, well, look at all the good things that Hitler did. He's saying, he's saying everyone would would be worse without Hitler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the the reductio ad Hitlerium. Here's a quick one for you. We don't have to to this would be its own episode, but which president would you eliminate from U.S. history? We don't have to answer it now, but definitely William Henry Harrison. 
<laughs> yeah, it's awful. All thirty days. Such a long right? and destructive presidency. I know it's horrible. Can't stand them. All thirty days. That would have changed everything. Yeah. So many bad things. Yeah. That is a that's an excellent question. That would be a good sequel. So um, yeah, and that's one we can do without. The, the, he just lost the election, but we can leave it at that without getting any calls from the Secret Service or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we'll try to. You're talking see. about Jimmy Carter. <laughs> No, who would be? Just kidding. Stay on the up and up. Yes. That's a tough one. All right, gentlemen. Well, well done with this. So that's our uh, first roundup episode. And as always, wonderful listeners, you can go to ParthenonPodcast.com to find all of our shows right there. And we'll check you out next time.